a lot strive and be different. So, if looking back at my past and the things that I've done to tell you who I am, um, the one on the further is the Federal Reserve, and that's with Tommy Amorphosis, and then this was um, the Science Center with Renzo Piano. I um, did Sovereign Center in Los Angeles and some others, but these are pretty much my babies, and my last baby that I did was um, the Riverwalk Pavilions, and that's I, that one was special for me because I, that's one I kind of got to do all by myself. I was younger, and also, it's also kind of special because that's the last project that um, that I was here when Detroit before I went back home and before my father died. And then, of course, this is also one of my babies working with Zaha Hadid in El Pro, Sacramento. She came to the city and she helped inspire me a lot to just do what you love. And so I've learned a lot from her. But it's very different and she's a very different person. And um, but she's still fun to work with. So I want to talk about buildings that play together that you probably never really paid attention to. I mean, you did. Um, this is by Prabhu. It's Shadagars in India. And just talking about the different colors and how those interact together. This is also by Prabhu, pushing the limits of um, actually design and how you can see the cantilevers are hanging. But it's actually pushing that limits of really what is concrete and expressing yourself a little bit differently. Uh, my favorite architect by all far is today Orlando, and um, he, I love him so much just because everyone always asks him why do you design out of concrete. He said because someone someone told him that he could. And so, therefore, he did it and he uh, does it till this day. And so, I love today, Oanto, very, very much. He's my favorite push, and he pays attention to detail, and he literally pushes the limit of architecture. Um, when it comes to Frank Gehry, I've grown to love him just because I've had the opportunity to be in their office and understand how they think. And so, before, I never did like understand why all these crazy things started to happen. But I really understand the idea of the play of the buildings together, and so I appreciate the fact that if you start to see the curves and how they start to interact together, they start to kind of have this conversation. So in architecture, we focus more on the conversations that are happening within the planes, whether they're horizontal or vertical. And so that's one of my um, favorites. Even looking at the idea of skin, and looking at the skin meaning the facade of a building, like we are in right now, Lafayette Towers and how this is a challenge for us as well. And then also talking about working with Morphosis, when I was working there, I appreciate the fact that once again what a facade means. These architects would challenge pretty much a lot on the, what elevation does, and so therefore windows just go wherever, but we actually think about that process and even how the sun's hitting them and the reflection. And then of course my favorite, um, I saw how she's um, a huge inspiration in she, when I was working with her, she always said, um, you know, just do what you love. You know, I would pay for you to her and even call on me for a question because I was always afraid that I would um, not answer the correct way or she would just say, that's stupid and move on to something else. But um, she's a very cool person and she pushes the envelope as well. So just the idea of how you can see the different plays between even the, these platforms here that are located here, the different floors and how there's color underneath them. And then this is um, by Ronan in Chicago. They created a youth center. And so you can start to see the play of the colors that are start, starting to happen and creating that youth in play, as well as a garden on top. This is um, LBNL. This was one of my other babies. Um, LBNL was, we were pushed by the, contra the contractors and developers that they wanted to put the cantilever over the span. The span here is about, it's more, it's more than 65 feet. And so they wanted to say, well, let's put cantilever, we have to put some columns underneath. And one of the architects that I was working with, Elise Barrier and I, we forced a lot to make that, make sure that the columns didn't get there. So they weren't able to be there and we were able to drive underneath with the fire truck. So that's what I feel that play is, and so maybe next time when you guys are thinking about designing your walking and looking at buildings and how they interact, you can kind of see the difference of how play is. But it's also all in the details. Um, one thing that I strive on is placement should always have something to do with purpose. And so at POG, I try to always make sure that 
whenever you're placing something, it has a purpose. It's not doing it because it looks cool or it's cute or it's pretty. I could care less about any of that. It's always about purpose for me. Um, and so what we're looking at, what Mies has done, this is in Chicago, just looking at the idea of how he's been able to interact the ground, even with the platforms. And so just looking, thinking about things like that and interaction. And here is um, the uh, Barcelona Pavilion, which was interesting enough, my first project in college that I had to rebuild. And um, the idea, he likes things as we're standing here in this building, you would feel that everything is floating. He has everything on his column where that there is the column isn't seen, and that's what he did in the Barcelona Pavilion, just respecting that. And then you can see here in Barcelona, this little thin beam is the beam for, um, it's the column that's holding up the structure. So he used majority of walls. Another woman that I that inspires me pretty much, and she's, most women do not give back. Well, I'll say a lot of women do give back in architecture, but I will say um, Janine Gang, she's a phenomenal woman in Chicago who, she was doing the, she does the aqua towers, and she was able to only do the facade. So she didn't do the interior of it. She didn't build the building, but they asked her to come and do the facade of the building. So it's interesting enough that when you're here in Chicago next time, you will see that the, how the aqua is created. And in her office, it's plastered a whole wall of the different iterations of what the aqua tower went through. So it's pretty cool. And then one of my other inspirations that you saw earlier, Julie Kim, she's the one who's in doing the M1 light rail here in Detroit. So this is her vision, and she now lives in Washington. And then going back to Frank Gehry, looking at the details of what play does, he has interacted the idea of wood and metal and light together. So that interaction plays a, a part, and not so much, it, it talks to each other. So that's very important to kind of create that language. And then this is um, getting gang as well, and so creating these light waves um, with the different, pushing the point of play with the idea of what the sides are doing and what wood can do and how it can bend. And this is today, Orlando, just paying attention to the detail of how everything interacts together, just not um, interacting with things because they can, but actually the idea of aligning this, this um, C channel here with this here. So I wanted to talk about what happened here, the definition of plan architecture and how it's changed. And I feel that sometimes we as architects and designers, we have um, defeated our own, we've become our own enemy <laughs> in architecture because I think that we try to solve the client's needs at, uh, too much and where we're no longer doing what we love. Some of us do it for a check. And so that's the difference, I think. Um, and I understand that because we all have to eat. Um, but like we're changing the idea of what we think is really architecture and just creating the idea of what a developer can do. Um, so we are allowing, I feel that sometimes we are our enemy, and I have this conversation many times with my mentors that, that we just say like we are our own enemies to creating this idea and changing play. Even the idea of like if you look at these row houses here, the idea of this being just stuck on to the side of a panel. And is that really playing together? versus something like this and them actually speaking together the different um, the different materials between a wood and the concrete and steel. So play at work, we are starting to create environments now, um, which is kind of interesting how this is taken to a, a whole new effect, how many work environments are creating play at work, which is working. Um, and I think it's working well and I think um, I mean, it's exciting to see that a lot of those changes are happening in the city, and so a lot of interior designers are, are changing the way that people work, and so that I do appreciate. And um, just looking at what others are doing differently at the top, I this is the one I love the most, and that's Lego in Denmark. But I always, always wonder also, like, how many times do you really use this slide at work? So <laughs> it's, yeah. it's cool, but like, is it functional? Like, that's where I talk about placement versus purpose, you know. It's critical. It's critical. Yeah. The slides are critical. You said it's what? They're critical. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, yeah, we can use it, but are you really going to use it, or is it just there to look cool? So it, I play back and forth on that. Um, creating play at home, um, I want to talk about what we're doing here. So the architect uh, record, as you know, many people have asked this is a historic building, and it is. And so we're, there's the joy of having three architects on this firm, on this 
building, but we, the interesting thing is we are all here, we are playing well together. And that's honestly probably the hardest thing that any architect would want to do because after a while you start to think that it's all about you and all these other things like that, and it's really not. So um, going back to what Mises is doing here at the Farnsworth and just looking at some of his details, and then of course what's across the way, which is also one of our other clients we're working with doing a, a whole renovation over there with um, one of the owners of Avalon Bakery. So she lives on this side, and so it's interesting to see the two from her house to here. And it makes me think of different things as I'm on this side and I'm thinking of her being here. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about the challenges that Quinn Evans, Cobb, and uh, Smith and Bridge are facing. Quinn Evans, they are the historic architects, so they're the architect of record. They're the ones that basically tell us, no, you cannot move this, <laughs> no, you cannot do that and um, all the things that we want to change. And one person that, I, that we are working with is Liz Mindy, and by far, she is a wonderful woman. Um, she is definitely one woman that definitely gives back, and I appreciate the fact that she has taken this call, I believe, for we to help us and to guide us and to like, you know, do different things of that nature. So um, it's really um, interesting to have her as, as someone to look up to. And then, of course, there's us. We are dealing with all, so Quinn Evans, they do the, everything on the skin. So right now, this side of the buildings, there's so many things going on. There's so many challenges with the heat, as you can, as you can see, as we can feel as we're in here, uh, the acoustics that are happening. So they pass a lot of our things, of all of our designs that we would love to do, and then some things that we can't do. So I'm hoping that a lot of you were able to get into the pool deck which is located on top of here, and that's kind of where we started as a whole. Um, Smith Group, JJR, they are doing the landscape architecture of it, so they're the ones who are dealing with, they also work with Quinn Evans as well, so to say which historic trees can go in here, which, which um, vegetation can happen, all of that starts to happen. So we, we can design as much as we like, and at top we're doing that, and so we're taking care of all the new additions. So anything that's new being added, podcast, Anything that's historic, Quinn Evans has, and Smith Group is doing the landscaping, so that makes it a little bit easier. Um, so we all kind of started on the pool and how to create play on this pool, because right now they have just a big, big blank pool, and they don't use the side, and so we did a design charrette, all firms in here, we were designed for three days straight, and um, came up with the idea of creating this party. And I think I have it better on the next slide. So we were creating some, um, these pavilion event areas that would be happening coming up the stairs. So if you're coming up these stairs here, you're creating the pavilions here and a barbecue pit here. So that's something that um, Cog will be doing, are these pavilions. The existing structure, Quinn Evans will be um, changing it a little bit and like restoring it, as well as taking some of the things down off of the pool. And then we came up with this soft hardscape palette, and I have it on the next one. And then we also created fire pits and a kid play space. Even though I'm still forcing the kid play space <coughs> over here, but that's neither here nor there. But that's pretty much what it's doing. Um, we started with these precedents, just talking about our friends at Kaboom, how they can be able to influence, but also just what the ground would be able to do and different undulations between, and then also what the pavilions were going to be. That's something that, believe it or not, all three of us are very passionate about and fighting about, but um, at the end of the day, I'm sure it will come out fine, and so we have a lot of designs for that. And then we're talking about the interiors of the space. We are, we went through different iterations where this room was going to be a cafe, and we were going to open up the doors here so people will be able to come in and have a cafe, and then in the lobby, he wants to be able to have more of a seating arrangement where you can come down, you can have your laptops and you know your iPads and hang out right there. So creating that community and life through here. And then we would talk about um, when we first started, Kate, um, one of the designers at Paul, she had this beautiful idea where the fitness centers are on the end. And so we thought, well, let's move them up to the third floor because that losing weight in this, in this room, it's not gonna happen. You know, it's just, it's not motivating, it's not at all. But versus going to the third floor and being able to look at the pool deck or looking out at the end, it's a little bit more pleasing and fun. 
And so we were totally okay with that story, and he was okay as well. And then on the 18th or 22nd floor, that's where they'll rent out these lounges because they don't have an area to have baby showers or book clubs or bachelor parties. They don't have any of that here. So that so that's the things that we're doing here at Paul. And uh, Ken Evans, they are having the pleasure of taking care of the heat, mechanical and HVAC and plumbing, as well as this beautiful parking deck that is corroding and shifts every time that we are pulling anything up up there. Um, so they, they are a huge part of it as well, and we're all trying to do different things. And um, dealing with the birds, but Evans is also dealing with the birds because the birds get stuck in between and they try to come up and into your unit, so they are putting screens there. So that will help a lot. <laughs> and, uh, and then also we have a lot of linking, as you can see on the ceilings here. So this is something that we at Paul are trying to restore and trying to fix at this moment in time as well. And our, our interior team, they came up with the idea of wanting to hang pendants in these beautiful areas to kind of like one, we were trying to figure out how to mask the echoing that's happening in here because it also happens in the lobby. So even though uh, Greg, the client, he would love to have, you know, a beautiful sitting area and that happen of that nature, but it needs to have some soft scale in there. So that's what the interior team was doing. And so we wanted to have these big, beautiful pendants, but historic shot us down a week ago. And so, um, <laughs> and Kate and I got the email and we called each other and we said, well, there goes those pendants. And um, so that's going to be kind of hard and how to create more light inside of these atmospheres because um, when Quinn Evans went down with the historic zone, they just said, it's going to mess up the sight line. Okay. <laughs> so that's the joy of working on a historic building. There's a lot of challenges that we have to face, but if it's historic, you're not going to be able to change a lot. So we're having to work with this beautiful green that's here and this beautiful travertine green because um, we cannot remove it. What makes this a historic building? The fact that these men were it in 1953. I mean, it's just, that's what it is. That's who he is. And then, so everything is labeled historic. Like, this whole park, this building, the pavilion, and the tower, and the townhouses back there, they're all historic. So we're dealing with the exact same challenges here over at our client for Alamo Bakery. The exact same challenges there. So, um, Um, it's not that I didn't know that they had an architect, actually one of my 
junior designers, he brought the article to me and was like, what do you think about this? And I'm like, yeah. Then when they, I saw they, they were creating shuffleboard to bring the young people back into the city, I said, oh, no, I have to call them. <laughs> Um, 
the main part of the play that we are taking a part of is on the pool deck. And so I'm hoping that everybody got to see what the challenges are up there because it's, it's dry up there. And so just the idea of um, having fun up there or being even encouraged to swim. One thing that we were talking about is Liz, she and I, we always tease each other that anyone from up there can see you swimming. And you don't, you know, not all of us like to show our bodies when we're swimming. And so we were thinking about, like, she wanted to create things like gondolas. And so we were thinking about different things of that nature. But um, so we're creating play on the deck and then as well as through all the units. So all of these units, all 584 units, are being redone and Kong's doing those. Well, give me some of your ideas of uh, what you think of cutting edge work. We all face the challenge of trying yeah. to be ahead or out of the box. But I mean, even a cafe is past day. Right. So yes, it is. Share some of your far out ideas. I would, what I, what I started out was, um, we started out with the course of the lounge. You can't get too crazy in this building, unfortunately, because of the way it is. But when we had first talked, we had talked about opening up, especially on this corridor, this one, to get some of that natural air inside of this building, to open up some of these um, glass pieces, to really take them off, put glass doors on them, and what happens if some of them start to become operable. Um, so as far, and then we also, as far as doing anything crazy, we wouldn't be able to do that here. What we're doing over on the other end, though, on the other unit, is we've created this big, eight foot scrabble wall, you know. Um, and so that's something that that we do a lot. Is that's pushing the envelope for me. Is where you take the, especially our client, they don't have a TV. They've never had a TV in their eight year old and twelve year old. So they are really into family time and playing together. And so we said, why not blow up Scrabble? So we did and they love it. And so those are the things that we kind of try to push as I listen to a lot of our clients and I try to push the envelope a lot. Even in um, my team, when we're not doing the architecture, but we're doing a lot of the interiors, I try to push the interior team to do something just different and out of the box where I, don't, I have already seen it. I don't want to, if it's been done, it's nothing great. So that's when we're talking about the cafe. I totally agree with you. But when you have beautiful other architecture firms with you, you're, you're still created in this box. Yeah. Well, I understand the challenges because you face the historical yes. restrictions also. But where would you look for inspiration to try to be ahead of the game? Um, I really, believe it or not, before I start any project, I go to the site. I go to the site by myself. And I'll sit there probably about three hours of my day. Um, that's what I did when we were walking the building. really what the place wants to be and what it should be. And so that's how I've been on for a while. And um, they taught me how to do college. And I think I lost it a little bit when I was put in a box right out of school. I think um, working for these certain architecture firms, it made me more scared, honestly, to work for them than it did to work for myself. <laughs> I And it's easy to manage them because I come from an entrepreneur family. But, um, it was scary to do that. And so we pushed, I literally pushed and blow up in different ways. And so I look at a lot of, um, just thinking of what's been done, I think a lot of precedents, tons of precedents of just details, and certain details will help me. Yeah. Yeah. So you're talking about um, the dance programs during the city. Yes. Some of the ideas that in the body will play and things like that. What happens is that I would go around to them, and after five o'clock, unless there's it's a button, it's dead. It's dead. It's it is. Dead. And some of the younger professionals, you know, we'd like to stay out here and stay longer, but on the other hand, they want to go to Royal Oak or Cordell or whatever. Exactly. So is there any plans in the future to kind of bring that to Detroit rather than keep it out of the I think it will come to Detroit with time, um, just like anything else. I think.
And they said it's too risky. And um, it's too risky for them to spend their money and their time. And so therefore, Dan Gilbert is doing the best that he can by bringing in certain atmospheres and certain things that already had about the suburbs. So when I even asked Apple, would we ever, like we just finished creating the Hudson Science Line. I think every architect, you, we, we all were part of it. You know, we all kind of part of that competition. And we had Target, we had Apple by themselves. And Apple just said, they're interested, but the risk of that is great. It's great. And so I think there's a little bit more challenges left that we have in Detroit. And I think um, when I was at the conference, Sue Mosley and um, Leslie from Tech Town, they spoke on Detroit and they did a phenomenal job because I thought that it was going to be a lot of luck. And I love, I respect both of them very much for just being honest and telling the truth that it's going to take us some time. And I think it will. But those that are willing to stay in Detroit, they'll stay here. And they'll see it out, but those that aren't, they will leave, and that's okay too. Detroit will still survive. I truly believe that it's, it'll, it'll take probably about 15 to 20 years to do it, but it will, it will get done. And uh, until then, you just have to balance out is it worth it for you at this time? I remember the story about, I remember reading the story about the shuffle when you brought, you brought that up. So, uh, I mean, it's great that you did it. My question for you is can you just do that more often? <laughs>
uh, created the fact uh, that we'll just work on children's faces. If I can think about anything where I can still be me and still do something crazy and wacky and still have this inspiration to do something out of the box ridiculous um, and go back to detail and go back to the people that I love and I've worked with, that's what they were about. And they were just about creating that. So then I figured, well, who would that? Who would I design for? And so then I started thinking about my life and what I really love the most. And even now, I'm a new pastor at my church. And so I thought, oh, I talk to kids all the time. I really love them. And then after a while, I started looking at kids' faces. And I realized that these kids' faces, how are you supposed to learn in this environment? It's so boring. And then you get mad when your kid brings home a bad grade. Well, I'm learning in a boring environment. So therefore, I figured, then I'll change that. That's what I'll do. And so then, so that's what POG stands for. It's that POG and will in this big atmosphere of architecture that at the end of the day, we're not trying to change the world. We're just trying to change a little piece of the pie, which is uh, changing kids, changing kids' faces, changing wherever they live, learn and play. Not only that, helping the idea of adults that when you become a parent, there's so many new things that you don't even think about that are, are frustrating for you. And then what happens when your kid gets sick and you have to go to work and now what? You know, and if you were working at a corporate life, where do you put your kid? You can't put them in daycare. So that's one of the things that we're working on right now with Diplomat Pharmacies is all this on-site child care and things of that nature. We're just working on how to solve that. What keeps you here? Because you could have been anywhere in the right. Because you decided to stay here and create a line and say, you have a baby, you have a husband, you have a career as an architect. Yeah. What makes you stay? What really makes me stay is the fact that I live, my husband, my husband, he's ready to go. He is. He's ready to go to Troy or Brazil or Ferndale. Like he's just ready to break to the suburbs. And I'm like, if we're going to the suburbs, I'm ready. I, I'd rather go back home. Because I grew up in the city, you know, and I, my, my young life, I was in Modesto, but then my adult life, I lived in San Francisco. And that's where I'm from, that's where I live. But what keeps me here is I live down the street off of Jefferson. And I see these kids every day just going to school, um, being in horrible environments, walking by blight. And people, we as a parent, we don't think that, oh, it doesn't matter that my kid has blight around them. But it does. It affects their psyche. But for some reason, people do not believe that. But it does. It affects their psyche as a person. And um, so to see all of these kids here and to believe that some of them have one parent or two parents, and I grew up with two parents, and to see that some of them uh, are being beat and not being able to believe that they can be the owner of, their, of this building, the person who bought this building is an African-American man. A majority of the people that live in this city are African-American. So they don't believe that they could ever own something like this, or they could ever be me. And so what keeps me here are those kids. It's truly, otherwise, yeah, I agree with you. I, no, let's do it. It's true, it's true, it's the kids. Otherwise, there's no need to be here. That I, I totally agree with you. I, especially me coming up from the city of San Francisco, a beautiful place, you know, my parents, beautiful, doctor, architect, Good question. 
for the kids to play in downtown. I would really want them to have a huge park that's just not full of what we call park equipment, but really stuff that is just not like this. You know, I, I get it, it's nice, it's a, you see it's a school that has the park equipment, but that's really not play for me. I would like to create a big park. I would, a huge park that has indoor, outdoor, and able to have the rock climbing, um, able to have areas where you can just sit out and hang out, water, noodles up for food. It, it would just, but that costs a lot of money, you know? <laughs> So that's what I would love to do, though. I would love to create a big atmosphere for kids downtown, because we don't have that, where it's open all the time. Yeah. And I would probably put a rec center on it for kids. And uh, that's open all the time, because one thing that I, I realized living down here in the city is that a lot of kids, they um, are being cursed at at home, being yelled at and cursed at. So by the time they leave here, school, to go home, they don't really want to go home. You know, because they know that they're going to be yelled at, kept first at something, one of them. And so I would like to have that safe haven for them to just go and get away. So they can, they can still strive to be. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Chandra. Yeah.